Hello friends, welcome Denny to this uh, Dr. Neeraj show. Thank you very much for joining from US. Uh, you are an asset to our profession. Thank you so much sir for joining us. Thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. We are welcome. Excited to be here. This is a great, you know, different times. We have to all adapt to different learning abilities, so it's good. <laughs> Wonderful. Um so so without uh, wasting any time, uh, Uh, shall we start the uh, study yeah uh, everybody can hear me okay can you hear me okay yes absolutely fine sir okay perfect perfect well welcome everybody i'm so glad that you took the time sunday evening to uh, come back for this uh, great uh, presentation you know i'm uh, really passionate about uh, learning new things and i love to teach you guys new things um, as i've always mentioned this is just another tool to help you uh, become a better uh, therapist and uh, become a better medical profession There's so many tools out there. There's never one tool that's going to make you the best. I like to introduce new things and then see if this patient will relate to it. So there's many uh, manual treatments out there. This is another uh, thing to add to your belt. And if a patient is um, going to be able to uh, qualify for this uh, based on what you see, then fantastic. Uh, but I, I have been using this technique, uh, postural restoration, I would say for the past uh, uh, probably five years consistently and have seen fantastic results. So um, I'm excited uh, to teach you uh, this. So let's go over this. Uh, last year I came to India. I had a really good time. I was actually going to come this year again, but uh, your airport is closed. <laughs> so uh, I was not able to come. Uh, so maybe uh, when all this uh, COVID-19 passes, I'll, I'll be able to do this uh, presentation live, uh, which will be uh, even better. But uh, what are we going to do today? Uh, well, I'm going to introduce you to Postural Restoration Institute and the philosophy. If you were in the class last year, you you uh, probably got an introduction to it, but it's always, always good to review. Um, we'll review the anatomy of the diaphragm, uh, be able to identify the normal infrasternal angle, um, be able to name muscles associated with the narrow infrasternal angle, be able to identify and perform key objective tests related to the infrasternal angle. And then uh, part two, once you have a basic uh, idea of all this stuff, um, I'll be able to show you exercises, but it doesn't make sense just to learn the exercises without learning the philosophy of it. Um, uh, so that's what I really want uh, you to understand. Once you understand the philosophy and why you're doing certain things, then it's easy. But if you just give random exercises to some people because you saw it on YouTube or because you saw it, someone else doing it, and you don't know the, the theory behind it, then it doesn't make sense. You always want to know why you're doing something something and why you're implementing it. Um, that's the key. <clears throat> All right. So what is posture? Well, <clears throat> we posture is not static. Sometimes we just look at a posture. We look at somebody just resting, but posture is not static. Posture is a reflection of the position of many systems that are regulated determined and created through limited functional patterns. So these patterns reflect our ability and inability to breathe, 
rotate, rest symmetrically with the left and right hemispheres of our axial structures. You're thinking, oh, it's pretty complicated. That's right. Posture is very complicated. And that's uh, Han, uh, Ron Haruska, which is the uh, founder of PRI. So here's the key. A poorly aligned body uses inappropriate muscle activity to function resulting in mechanically inefficient joints and pain. So if you need to get to point A to point B, let's say you have to go use the restroom. So you have to get up off the couch and you have to go there. Well, your body is going to get you there. But it, if you start using the wrong muscles, you become inefficient. Okay. And that is a poorly aligned body. So <clears throat> we'll discuss what that means. All right, so posture is neuroreflexive and based on the brain's ability to regulate many systems, not just length tension relationships. So you're thinking that it's neuroreflexive. So a lot of times we have to get the neural system working correctly, right? In order for us to regulate our posture. We can't just say, oh, somebody has a forward rounded uh, shoulder, tell them to squeeze their shoulder blades. If their brain can't process what that means, then you're wasting your time by just saying, okay, sit up straight, stand up straight. It doesn't make sense. So we have to uh, include the neural system. And there's many new uh, theories out there uh, that is uh, involving that pain science, DNS and all that. And these are all great tools. Like I said, PRI is just one aspect that we're going to include. And there's, I use a, a variety of techniques as one technique is never, because you might have a patient that PRI does not work for. Then we can use DNS. We can use manual therapy. Some people, they have so much pain, we can't do anything. Maybe they just need a little bit of rest. They need that. So there's lots of tools. I just don't want you to think that, oh, uh, Dr. Patel only uses PRI, only uses that. No, no. I believe in anything that helps helps a patient. So whether that be manual therapy, Maitland, McKinsey, anything. But right now, I have focused solely on PRI. And I, I will tell you that I have seen the best results from PRI. And that's why I want to share this fantastic new uh, uh, technique with you. And I hope uh, you can use it in the clinic because I think it works very, very well. I still use total motion release too. I've been doing some telehealth and total motion release works really well. So uh, I love all that. Um, so what is postural restoration? So let's, let's talk about this. Postural Restoration Institute was established in 1999 to explore and explain the science of postural adaptations and asymmetrical patterns in the human body. So postural restoration is an innovative treatment approach developed by Ron Ruska. It involves treating the whole body with muscle activation exercises, manual techniques, and breathing to reverse compensatory patterns and inhibit overactive chains, okay? Now, PRI is a holistic posture-based approach to management of patients, which considers the influence of the skeleton, muscles, and dental occlusion. So th think about this. Even if your patient has a uh, uh, teeth issues or jaw issues, of course, it's going to affect their posture and affect, of course, it's going to affect their ability uh, for neck pain or shoulder pain. But that's a whole different side of it. Uh, it also considers the influence of multiple systems on posture, such as the respiratory, which we'll focus on today, nervous, autonomic, central and peripheral. So we'll talk about that. Musculoskeletal, of course, that's what we do best. Motor, circulation, reproductive, digestive, immune and sensory also auditory. So when a patient comes into our clinic, we always think musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal, because that's what we train in. But the nervous system, the respiratory system play a huge role in how our patients uh, react. So I'm going to show you that. So PRI is practiced by physical therapists, physical therapy assistant, athletic trainers. These clinicians have shared findings, beliefs, and concepts that guide and direct many aspects of patient management. Examinations are performed to assess posture alignment reflected in three planes. So we look at the frontal, the sagittal, and the transverse plane, the position of the body, and whether or not pathology exists as a result. So <clears throat> the focus of PRI is on restoring faulty posture 
or pathomechanics believed to be a cause of complaints toward normal rather than directing interventions toward the painful extremity or region of complaints. So when a patient comes in for knee pain, I don't want you to focus on the knee <laughs> because so far we say a patient comes in, oh, it hurts in the knee. A patient comes in for back pain, we go straight to the back. But PRI, and we're going to look at everything. We're going to look at the joint below. We're going to look at the joint above. And today, more importantly, I'm going to show you, we're going to focus on the diaphragm and the infrasternal angle. And you're thinking, oh my God, I don't even know where the infrasternal angle is. Well, perfect. That's why you're here to learn about everything. But the diaphragm and the infrasternal angle um, is going to be good. If you talk to Dr. Nir Benzali and uh, Dr. Vikas Patel, they've read uh, many articles on the diaphragm and there's a huge correlation with uh, the, the diaphragm and the influence on low back pain, a lot of new research coming out. But you know what? In the clinic, we don't even focus on the diaphragm and uh, it's going to be uh, something that we really want to uh, uh, consider when we're treating neck pain and low back pain. And I'll be honest with you, once I started looking at the breathing mechanics and started looking at the diaphragm, it, it's worked wonders. So this is, is going to be great for you. Uh, pelvic position is always uh, restored uh, first. We like that. Uh, last year, I showed you some uh, simple uh, techniques that I use to uh, restore the pelvis, and I'll review a little bit of that as well. That's always good to review. The clinician's goals are often to decrease unwanted hypertonicity via muscle inhibition to facilitate muscle balance. So certain muscles will be, uh, don't have to be so active, such as hip flexors, paraspinal. So a lot of times patients come in with overactive hip flexors and overactive paraspinals. And what do we do? We'll try to stretch the hip flexor. We'll try to massage the paraspinals. But did you know that if you can get a patient to just exhale, now remember the diaphragm has attachments to L3, L4. If we can exhale, it will actually indirectly release the psoas and you don't even have to stretch it. The hip flexor will automatically relax. And you're thinking, oh man, so the, the, this is good stuff. So you're learning that, hey, everything is connected together. You learned anatomy a long time ago. This is now putting everything you learn together and saying, okay, okay, the body does work uh, uh, together. So it's going to be fantastic. So muscle balance or repositioning will enable certain muscles to be in a better position to work so they are in a better position to rest. <laughs> See, this is often accomplished via muscle activation of specific muscles. <laughs> this is often accomplished uh, on a specific side of the body, such as hamstrings, glute medius, and glute max. And all of this will make sense as I start giving examples. I know that the, the concept is a little foreign. Uh, and when you first hear it, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is very complicated. So people say, you know, I don't like it but it's actually very simple. Uh, I'm just giving you a little background information, but once I make it simple, simple for you, it'll be really good. Okay, so let's, let's discuss this. Um, PRI discusses uh, these chains, and there's these chains have influence on our various postures. And there's three chains that um, the body uh, focuses on. It's the anterior interior chain, and that chain is the diaphragm, the iliacus, the psoas, the TFL, vastus lateralis, and the biceps femoris, okay? And how that's influenced through our respiration. So that's why the infrasternal angle is gonna be huge. Trunk rotation, the rib cage, again, infrasternal angle, and the spine. So you can think about, look at all these muscles, the diaphragm, the iliacus, the psoas, the TFL, vastus lateralis, and biceps femoris. Think about in your clinic how often you come in and you've either stretch the TFL, you stretch the psoas, but did you make a permanent change or did you just stretch one muscle? Because remember, it's part of this anterior interior chain and the big leader is the diaphragm. So if you didn't focus on the diaphragm, then your stretches for the iliacus, your stretches for the psoas, your stretches for the TFL are not gonna be long lasting. Patients will get temporary relief for sure. You know, you stretch them for a little bit, they feel good for a little bit, then guess what? The patient says, I have the pain again. So we didn't make a permanent change in their body mechanics and we didn't make a permanent change in their anterior interior chain. So if you look at the posterior chain, that's the posterior intercostals, serratus posterior, lats, QL, iliocostalis. Um, that influence the lumbar lordosis, the thoracic flatness, SIs, 
and respiration. Look at that, respiration again. So if we don't fix respiration, then our lats and our QL will continue to be tight. So you have patients that have lumbar lordosis statically and you're thinking, okay, we need to do this, that, but if we don't fix respiration, they will always have that lumbar lordosis. They will always have the thoracic flatness because think about this, the number one thing your body has to do is breathe. You have to breathe to survive. So the body is always going to find a way to get air into your lungs and then out of your lungs. Otherwise, you can't exist. And guess what? The body will use every muscle it thinks to make you breathe. Okay? It can use intercostals, posterior, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, upper trap, you name it. It will find a way for you to breathe if these, if your diaphragm is not working appropriately. So this is where the infrasternal angle is huge, right? So the concept is, so this is a, you know, it's a huge revolutionary concept that you have to understand is that what we're trying to do is find the source of why this patient in the clinic is coming with chronic neck pain, chronic low back pain, okay? And we have to find the source and the source is a lot of times the diaphragm and rib cage and infrasternal angle. And you're thinking, oh, you know what, Dr. Brett, it's very confusing, it's very complicated. It's not, it's actually very easy and I'll, I'll explain it to you, so it was good. Now the brachial chain, that's the sternocleidomastoid, scalenes, deltoid, pecs, and look at who we have again, diaphragm. So you get influence of cervical rotation and chest expansion. So a common theme you see in these chains is what? Diaphragm, diaphragm, diaphragm. So this is gonna be a fantastic, fantastic uh, presentation for you to understand. <clears throat> okay, so now this is what you're gonna see in the clinic, okay? And this is where you're like, okay, Patel, you got to the point now. You're like, okay, tell me the good stuff. Well, here it is. I had to give you a little background, the boring stuff to introduce, but now you say, tell me what the patient that comes into the clinic, what am I going to see? So that when the patient comes into the clinic, this is the compensation that you'll see. You'll see a patient with most of their weight on their right side. You'll see their eyes are uneven. You'll see a lower right shoulder. You may see a C curve. Okay. And I want you to write this down if you have a pen and paper handy, because during the week before we convene again next week, I want you to see how many patients come into the clinic with this. And you're like, oh, Patel, the Surat is on lockdown. We don't have any patients. I don't see anybody. You know what? Get your family members. You guys are stuck at home anyway. Every single family member is a mommy, daddy, bye, Ben. It doesn't matter. Everybody, you look, how many of them have a right higher hip? How many have the left foot rotated out? How many have their left knee bent? How many of their neck is side bent and rotated to the right? How is their torso counter rotated? Okay, so I want you to examine them and then you're saying, and you can say they have pain, okay? And these are compensations that people have made in order to get air in and out because they have to breathe. Okay, so you, a lot of times you see, you'll do a static posture and say, oh, you know what, mister, you have a right low shoulder. Your, uh, uh, you know, left shoulder is higher. You have a scoliosis, uh, a C curve, and uh, well, we have to give in. Then you focus on just one part. Or you have a high hip. Guess what? We're going to have to put a, a insert or we're going to have to put a, give you a shoe that makes this. Uh, and you, you just focus on one thing. But you got to think this whole person, the whole person is what you have to focus on. So this pattern is what I want you to recognize. OK, but most of the times people will be shifted. Do you see, David, see this shift where everybody has that? So look at people that stand. They'll shift all their weight on their right side. And you're thinking, why is that? And I'll, I'll show you why that is. And uh, this guy is really good to Neil Halliman. I'll refer to him, but he makes uh, PRI real simple. There's a lot of people that uh, are very good at PRI. I've uh, learned a lot from, I've taken a lot of courses. So I try to make it simple. Sometimes people make it too complicated. It's not that complicated, but we want to make it simple because remember our patient wants everything simple. If you start thinking too high level, then they get uh, turned off. So we want to be simple with everything we teach our patient. Then they'll be like, oh. And the other thing I want you to remember is 
patients, you don't want to, they want to know why they have the problem. So if you can educate your patient as to why they have this, they will be like, oh, that makes sense. Thank you for explaining it to me. We don't want to be so high level that, hey, I'm the doctor and you're the patient that I don't have time for you to explain. No, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to talk to the patient like that's your mother, that's your grandma, and that's your brother and have the respect for the patient and say, this is why I'm helping you. Remember, we're all medical professions because we want to help people. So you treat them with respect and you treat them like, hey, I want to help you and they will love you for it. That's the one thing I want you to do or get anything out of that is be very respectful to the patient, very respectful and educate them why they have pain. You know, sometimes people come into the clinic and no one has ever taken the time to say, why do I have this pain? So, you know, be empathetic and say, this is why, and they will really, really consider. Remember, part of therapy is psychological, right? If we're very mean to our patients and we don't take the time, they will never get better. So that's a whole different uh, story, neuro pain science, but you have to incorporate that into your uh, thinking as well. Okay. I hope everyone is enjoying the uh, the lecture and you can hear me okay. Uh, um, so I'm um, you guys on the chat and YouTube. Hello, everybody. I uh, Hopefully everyone is enjoying it. Uh, give me a thumbs up on the chat and I can see you, uh, everybody. <laughs> All right, so you might see a neck side bent and rotating uh, left. You'll see a torso that's counter rotated, okay? And the left pelvis is oriented to the right. So you see this pattern, right? Okay. Now, we will stand mostly on our right side, okay? And why is that? So a lot of time people say, oh, it's because I write with my right hand. No, this is uh, something that we want to uh, uh, see. It, <clears throat> we want to offset the weight in the left upper chest, okay? Because we're not breathing correctly. Left side of the pelvis tilts forward, so you get an anterior tilt, okay? So when you guys are doing posture uh, assessment, you're thinking, oh, he has an anterior tilt. And then therefore, your right shoulder is going to move down. And guess what? Our left abdominals become weaker. So this is our patterns that you see in the clinic all the time. And you're thinking, why is it happening? Now, see, with this uh, presentation, you'll be like, okay, I can understand why this is happening instead of just focusing on the static posture. So let me, uh, uh, I'm going to show you how PRI works in simple, uh, and I'm going to uh, share this with you. Uh, um, let me uh, share it uh, YouTube. Uh, hold on a second. Because that way you see.
Do you hear this now? Uh, sir, it's still not audible. Okay. No problem. You guys couldn't hear the uh, the uh, audio. That's okay. I will. Uh, that was just basically uh, going over what I'm gonna uh, tell you. <clears throat> I will. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'll explain it to you. You know, instead of watching the video, you can hear my voice anyway. <laughs> it was basically the same thing. I just wanted to show you the video. I'll I'll send you the link, or I'll have Dr. Bensali send you the link so you can watch it afterwards. Uh, yeah, I'll explain it. It's easier, you know. Uh, hearing it from the uh, the Indian brother uh, instead of the uh, the other gentleman, you'll be hear it. <laughs> uh, see, you have to always be a uh, 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 good uh, good sense of humor. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's talk about what we see in the clinic. <clears throat> okay, so when we see someone in the clinic, <clears throat> uh, um, their one or both legs will be turned out when sitting standing or lying down okay they'll have development of cons compensatory muscles such as their sternocleidomastoid or their scalenes will be real thick they'll favorable standing on the right side while their upper body is rotated to the left so you'll see they'll stand on their right side but we can't always lean on the right side because guess what they'll do they'll rotate their whole body to the left side so that's why you see some patients with scoliosis but that's not the scoliosis is a functional scoliosis that they're just doing to compensate. So a lot of patients that come in with scoliosis, you know, it, that's something that we can change. Now, there's structural scoliosis and then the functional scoliosis. So a lot of times the uh, when we see someone that's doing diagnosed with scoliosis, we have to say, well, was it what was what the curve? And we want to say, OK, what's really going on here? OK, now the other thing is you guys all do gait assessment, correct? watch how people walk and you'll see that they will not move their right side very much okay their right arm will not move nowadays we all walk with the the phone in the hand and a forward head so it's very difficult but if you just watch someone walk watch their gait pattern and their right side will not move as much and that's a compensatory uh pattern that they've done they'll have elevated ribs on the left, okay? They'll have a lowered, depressed shoulder on the right. And if you look at a patient's face, now don't stare at their face, but uh, if you look at their face, and you can do that with your family, look at their eyes, see if their eyes are even. And here's another funny thing is look at your nose and look at the opening of the nostrils. If one opening is narrow, and the other one is wide, they're actually breathing only through one nostril. So you know how um, in yoga, we actually do the nostril breathing where we open one side and we open the other side. I think that's fantastic. So you, you see our ancestors from yoga had a lot of good philosophies. The problem with a lot of the stuff that we do in the Indian culture is we don't know why we do it. We just say, you know, for years, our ancestors have that is good for you. Of course, it's good for you, but why, right? So now, you know, if you can understand more of the mechanics of why we do it, then you'll be like, hey, that makes sense. So yes, we want to do the yoga. You know how Guru Ramdev does the breathing one nose and the other. He's on the right track, but he's never able to explain why we're doing it. So people blindly do it. And they say, okay, but when a patient asks us why we're doing it, we have to be able to explain why, and then they'll be more likely to do it, right? So the reason, and then when I teach you some of the exercises, I will always tell you why we are doing this. So then you'll be able to understand it. So <clears throat> the, the, the nostril breathing, the yoga breathing, breathing in through one nose and breathing out the other, it actually helps balance our body. Now, if you look at if you just breathe out, a lot of times we only breathe out through one nostril at a time. Now, if we just favor that one side, the other nostril will close down. So we get this shift in our body and our face becomes shifted to the right side or left side. So it's very, very interesting. See, now you're understanding why I like to explain why we're doing stuff. And look at this. 
curvature of the spine. How many patients have you had with scoliosis thinking, oh, I'm sorry, there's not much we can do. But you know what? There is st stuff that you can do. Um, okay, so why do we have this tendency to shift to the uh, uh, right side. Why do we do that? And, um, you know, I love the chat to see nostril breathing activates. I didn't, but yes, there's uh, uh, lots of stuff that uh, I love it because you guys are all very smart. Everybody plays a role in, uh, so if you like to chime in on the, the chat and uh, say, you know, I do this or I do that, well, I love the interaction. So, you know, this is a community where we want to interact and share our knowledge. I never want to say that I know everything. I learned uh, from Dr. Benzali, Dr. Vika, that's why all of you, you know, even students teach us every time. So we want to build a community where all of us trust each other, where all of us are learning together. And that's what that's what makes a good community. So when we have a strong community together, everybody's like, you know what, that whole group in Surat, all that community of physios together, they're so happy and they work together. And that's what we like. And then we want a good name for everybody. And I think Dr. Neeraj Bansali has a uh, built a good culture for uh, physios, uh, Dr. Vikas Patel, and I met a lot of good people. And so that's why I like working with you guys, because you are so happy and you want to help people. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's why we are here to help other people. You know, uh, we only have a small time on this planet and we want to be remembered for the people we helped. Uh, so that's why we did this stuff. Right. So let's go back to PRI. Why are we uneven? Right. So if you look at the inside of your body, look at this. Our liver is on the right side. We don't have two livers. We have a dominant liver on just the right side. Okay, now here's a here's a good trick, okay, everybody? Uh, um, what I want you to do is <clears throat> go ahead and cross your arms, okay? Cross your arms together. And do you notice that if your right thumb is on top, or left thumb is on top, okay? Do you guys see what I mean by crossing your arms together? So cross your arms together like this and see if your right thumb is on top or left thumb is on top. And if your right thumb is on top, guess what? Your left brain dominant. If your left brain is on top, your right brain dominant. So I'll be honest with you, those that have the r left thumb on top, you actually are more symmetrical than all of us with the right thumb on top. And this is where, you know, unfortunately it's not live, I'd like to show you, but yeah, how many of you, okay, in the chat, tell me if the right thumb is on top or those on the left thumb and we'll uh, kind of see the, the difference. <clears throat> yeah, so, a lot of you will see that, hey, you're right. And even if you if you try it the other way, those that have the right thumb on top, try to put your left thumb on top and you'll be like, oh, that doesn't feel good <laughs> because your brain is like, okay, it's wired. But those that have the left thumb on top, that's good. That means you're more balanced, actually. <laughs> so, Dr. Bensali, look, your left thumb on top, we knew you were balanced uh, already. <laughs> but all of us that have the, uh, the right thumb on top, you're left brain dominant, okay? So this is very good to understand. And okay, what, what, why is that? So let's go a little bit more into this. Uh, see, majority of us is on right, uh, uh, but that's our left brain on top. So okay, let's let's talk about why we have three lobes on the right, and we only have two on the left. So see, you have a gravitational pull to that right side, and your heart is slightly to the left. But research has shown that due to these small variances, we have a gravitational shift to that right stance. And that's perfectly normal. So guess what? God made us asymmetrical and we should be able to go right, left, right, left. The problem is when we start favoring only the right side and we forget the left side. So think about our Indian culture. Just think about this. If you are born and guess what? God forbid you start writing with your left hand, guess what we do in the Indian culture? We say, no, no, that's very bad. And we try to force people to use the right hand. You see that? So we, we, we are confusing the brain and telling that I, even though I want to use my left hand, I will go only use my right hand. And of course, in the Indian culture, we have the left hand for hygiene and stuff like that. But if you're wired one way or the other, 
and we force us to use one side, we're confusing our natural pattern already. So how many of you were uh, lefties and then your parents forced you to use your right hand, right? So this asymmetry started at a very young age, you see? My son is lefty, so I just <clears throat> I just uh, um, let him be, and he's very artistic, very good at sports, and very good. He's uh, 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 you know symmetrical. He actually has less issues than uh, me because uh, the left uh, sidedness. He's able to shift from right to left. So do what your body is naturally don't force anything to one side or the other okay so when you have kids if your kid is lefty you know what that's natural don't worry about it he ha he will actually have less pain than you and i <laughs> <clears throat> now what is the most common pattern and this is where you guys uh, i want you to uh, understand this look at this look at this pattern right here look at all the muscles most common pattern we're gonna see is a left anterior, interior chain and a right C. Look at all these muscles. Now, if you have a, uh, take this screenshot or write this down because this will help you tremendously in the clinic. What you're gonna see on the patient, <clears throat> you're going to see. So everybody, uh, what I want you to do is write, take a screenshot of this. And uh, during the, uh, the week, I want you to test how many people you see with this pattern, okay? Their left side of the pelvis is going to be in an anterior tilt. Their right side of the pelvis is going to be in a posterior tilt. Their low back will be oriented to the right. And you're thinking, how do I know this? Well, there's uh, uh, physical findings, but I'll show you some tests that you can do. Now, again, the patient doesn't have to have all this, but they might have a majority of this. <laughs> Their left hamstring and adductor magnus, they're gonna be long, and therefore they're going to be weak. Their left abdominals are gonna be long and therefore weak. Their right side of the trunk is going to be shorter, okay? Their left ribs are going to be externally rotated, and I'll show you how to see that on the uh, today. Now, thoracic spine, is rotated to the left above T8. Your cervical spine is rotated and side bent to the left, okay? And I'll show you uh, what that means. Their shift of the left scapula, so they're gonna have tight pectorals and a tight levator on the left. They're gonna shift of the right scapula, so they'll have weakness in their right levator because it's gonna be elongated. And guess what? their right sternocleidomyostoid is gonna be very overactive. And what's gonna happen is because they're not getting air into this side, they're gonna breathe using their right sternocleidomyostoid. They're, they're gonna have, so you're gonna come in with patients that have right anterior neck pain and you're thinking, what's going on here? Guess what? That's because their rib cage, they're not getting expansion on the right side. So guess what? They have to get air in and out. So they use their sternocleidomyostoid to breathe. You see what I mean by the body wants to breathe and they'll use any muscle necessary to get air into your lungs because you have to survive that way. So you see how you're, you're learning why we uh, do certain things, why the patient comes in with right side neck pain now. You understand why people say, you know what, my levator is always tight. And what is our usual treatment? And you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's because we learned this. We'll do a little ultrasound on the levator. We'll do a little uh, massage. But if we didn't even look at their rib cage, we didn't look at their infrasternal angle, guess what? Next week in the clinic, they say, it didn't work. I still have pain. Give me medicine. Give me a shot. Let's do an MRI. Of course, you do an MRI. There's about 200 people on this chat, 300 people. If we did an MRI of everybody on you, guess what? you're all gonna have some kind of problems in your neck. That's called A-G-E, age. <laughs> we all have problems, but it doesn't mean that, that the MRI is gonna correlate to why you're in the clinic. So be careful with patients that get focused on MRIs and they say, oh, I have a C5, C6 disc herniation. You know what? 
I may not have pain and I might have a C5, C6. Don't worry about that. We have to make sure that the MRI findings correlate to why the patient is here. Okay, so that that is something that we want to focus on, and that's why we have to be uh, be careful with uh, uh, diagnostic imaging. I love diagnostic imaging, but it has to match the diagnostic imaging has to match why the patient is in the clinic. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So who's the patient that comes into the uh, the clinic? So write this down as well. Uh, I hope you're. Uh, uh, so the patient that comes into the clinic with all these problems is someone that has right side low back pain. Now you're thinking, okay, what if somebody has left side back pain? That's okay because what they did is they started off with right side and it converted over to the left side. Neck pain, as I explained, they'll have a protracted right scapula. They'll have an overactive right sternocleidomastoid. Oh, look at this, left sciatica. How many patients have you had that have left sciatica and you're thinking, how do I treat this? guess what? This is the pattern because they have an overactive left piriformis. And we know from anatomy, the piriformis goes over the sciatic nerve. So if we don't fix the problem, right, then that piriformis will always stay overactive, compress the sciatic nerve, and then we're back to long-term chronic pain and long-term sciatica. So then they do, let's, let me give you an example of this overactive left piriformis situation. They have a sciatic pain down the left uh, leg, right? We, uh, we, you do your conservative normal, uh, normal uh, therapy, and they, and they say, oh, it doesn't work, doesn't work. Then they get an MRI, the MRI shows that, oh my God, you have stenosis. Oh my God, you have uh, L4, L5 disc herniation, three millimeter, five millimeter. And then they do surgery because they base it on the MRI. And guess what? They have the surgery and they say, oh, the surgery didn't work. Because hello, you never fixed the left piriformis issue. And guess what? Uh, the sciatic nerve is still compressed. <laughs> so you missed the whole boat. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is like that, but imagine if you could only help five people, 10 people and avoid the surgery because you knew where to look the left piriformis uh, because it's overactive. And it's not as simple as just doing soft tissue to the left piriformis or giving them a left piriformis stretch. That's all temporary, right? So think about this. How many times have you given them a crossover stretch, a piriformis stretch? They say, oh man, this feels really good but then they go home and they come back and says, I still have pain because you never fix the reason why the left piriformis is tight. You just fixed it temporarily. You didn't fix the anterior tilt. You didn't fix the respiration. So guess what? Of course it's going to be uh, uh, tight. So is all this making sense of how as a student, you know, if I was a student 20 years ago and somebody explained this to me, I would be so much better now. So that you guys have a fantastic, you know, uh, the technology is improving. So this is this is so good that you're learning this at a very young age, you know, uh, that you can start helping people at a very early age. And this is going to be, this motivates you to say, wow, that is fantastic. Thank you. And I wish I had something like that. Look at the right knee pain somebody that comes in with right knee pain. So here's something that I want you to understand. Somebody that comes in with right knee pain, uh, right low back pain, right neck pain, that's the beginning of their problems, okay? We want that, we, want, we can help them immediately with PRI, okay? Somebody that comes with left knee pain, left low back pain, left neck pain, bilateral, those are people that have compensated for many, many, many years. So when they've compensated for many years, and I, you know, we had a good time last year. Uh, you know, the interaction was really good. And I said, what did I say? Valakse. <laughs> and that, that, I love that. I had so much fun last year with you guys. We were such a good group. I, uh, you know, but it does take a little bit uh, 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 longer uh, time when somebody has the left knee pain because guess what? guess what? They've compensated throughout the years, but it's okay. You know, we still have to, we, we still can help them. We could still can help them. Okay. So guess which muscle controls our posture the most? You guys know, right? Yes. The diaphragm, the diaphragm. Now we actually get into uh, um, why we're here. Okay. So why we're uh, doing what we're doing. Um, so 
I hope that uh, you guys are still uh, uh, enjoying this. And uh, if you need a little break or anything, but let's let's dive right into it. Hopefully, you guys are uh, uh, um, uh, understanding this. And uh, I will talk to Dr. Bansali about uh, uh, making this uh, PowerPoint uh, available for you as a, maybe a PDF, uh, so you can uh, reference it uh, because I think that will be uh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so th let's take a look at this. The diaphragm, we can see how the diaphragm's attachment at the lumbar spine, lower six ribs and sternum can influence both the thoracic and abdominal cavities. So look at the diaphragm. Look what goes through the diaphragm, the inferior vena cava, the esophagus, okay, the aorta. So think about this, guys. Think about even yourself. How many people do you think have acid reflux? How many people do you think have GI issues and they say, oh, I have acidity? Everybody in India say, oh, I have acidity. And you're thinking, why? Think about this. If I have a diaphragm that is so tight and it pushes, look at my esophagus. Look, if it makes it so small and if I, if I just keep taking medicine for my acidity and I don't fix the opening of the esophagus, Oh my goodness, I'm always going to have acidity, even if you change. And guess what? People say when you change, stop eating spicy foods, stop eating stuff. Yes, that will change it because then this inflammation goes down, but the, the around it is still going to be tight. Why don't you teach them how to stretch their diaphragm by exhaling? And guess what? their GI problems go away. So guess what? You know, people in yoga say, if you breathe correctly, your stomach feels better, your intestines feel better, you, your, your digestion is better. Well, guess why your digestion is better? You no longer have this vice squeezing on your esophagus and there you go. So now you understand why yoga is influenced, but you never, you never understood it, why it helps. Here's the scientific reason one of the scientific reasons of why that works. Breathing will take the pressure off the esophagus and you're like, oh my goodness, that's fantastic. But now it's not as easy as, okay, fixing the diaphragm because we have to fix other things. But now you understand. Now think about your patients that have high blood pressure. Okay, so now let's go back to, if I have something that is squeezing venous return, inferior vena cava, if I have something that is squeezing the aorta, of course, I'm going to have high blood pressure. If I'm not breathing correctly, then I'm squeezing the aorta and that, oh my goodness, you know, and then what it, people will say, yes, you need to eat better. You need to walk better. But if we don't teach them how they need to exhale and breathe better, they'll always have to take medication for their high blood pressure. You see? You see how the breathing postural restoration is more systemic and we're teaching you the circulatory system, digestive system, respiratory system it is, it, do you understand this? And uh, the, the, the yoga, the Vedas and all that, they know all this, okay? They know the breathing is important, but now we can teach them why and show them physically what's going on. So when a patient sees it that, hey, if you're not breathing correctly, you're pushing on your esophagus, you're pushing on your blood, uh, vena cava, you're pushing on your aorta, and they physically see, oh, thank you for explaining that. Then they're more likely to focus on the breathing. So this is why yoga is so beneficial. But he, the reason yoga is beneficial is because we're fixing the diaphragm. You see? So, yeah. But look at the diaphragm attachment to L4, L3. So imagine this. If I have tightness in my diaphragm right here and I influence the 12th rib, look at this. The psoas major goes through the diaphragm. The quadratus lumborum goes through the diaphragm. So if I have tightness here, guess what? Of course, I'm going to have low back pain. <laughs> it is automatic because I'm squeezing the muscle here. Okay, so you guys see how it's everything is related. So from the diaphragm, we're getting an influence in the digestive system, the circulatory system, venous return, lymphatic system, and of course, musculoskeletal system. So 
this is this is i hope this is something that you're enjoying and is making sense because when i learned this stuff i was so excited because now i can explain to patients and it's fantastic um i'm not going to play the video of why the diet because you're uh, not going to be able to see the uh unfortunately the diaphragm uh, um but that's okay <laughs> now the diaphragm has two predominant functions it's going to work as a posture and respiratory so from the postural side we're going to get the diaphragm descends to increase intra-abdominal pressure during both lower and upper extremity trunk movements with greater activation upon lower extremity movements it has minimal if any contribution to the trunk <clears throat> It has <clears throat> its activity is minimally influenced by trunk rotation and position. Okay. The diaphragm's respiratory function is inhalation. As we take a breath of air in, the diaphragm descends. So when you breathe in, guess what? <clears throat> the diaphragm is going to descend here. Okay expanding both the pleural cavity and displacing the abdominal viscera. So take a deep breath in and the diaphragm goes down. And the reason the diaphragm is going to go down is going to make, guess what? Room for the lungs. So that is, most people have no problem with it coming down. But when it comes down, it can squeeze on the esophagus, the aorta, and that. The key is actually exhalation when you exhale your diaphragm will actually dome it'll come up and ascend and when it does that that actually relaxes relaxes and it will take the pressure off the esophagus inferior vena cava and aorta so the number one thing that we want to teach our patients is not inhale but as exhalation. So if you take anything away from today, I want you to teach your patients how to breathe correctly. But number one thing, I want you to teach them how to breathe out. <sighs> breathe in through your nose, but breathe out <sighs> through your mouth. So exhale two times longer than you inhale, and that will start relaxing the diaphragm. When patients start doing this for this first time, guess what they're going to feel? A little dizzy. They're going to feel a little dizzy and they're going to feel lightheaded. The reason is you're getting so much exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide that they haven't uh, had before that their pressure is going to change and they're going to feel a little different. Okay, so be careful when you do it too dramatically. They have to start very slowly, but what you want to uh, do is um, understand this. So yeah, you know, I love the comments. People are very uh, talking about exhalation, stuff like that, but you, you knew this already, but now you're able to explain the interrelationship of why this is. Like I said, we know that yoga works, but now from a scientific standpoint, you are understanding why it works. And this is the key with everything in our Indian culture is we want to know why. Our ancestors are very smart, but they, uh, when you look at it as a, why are we doing certain things? Why is it? And it goes back to the basic fundamentals of breathing. Okay. All right. So before we talk infrasternal angle, there must be an understanding about healthy breathing and mechanics. Okay. So altering pressure drives how we breathe, move, and interact with our environment. Hiding behind the majority of movement dysfunction is a pressure problem. So the diaphragm is the king of the inspiratory muscle. When the diaphragm descends, so when we inhale, the interpolar pressure decreases and the abdominal pressure rises. With lung pressure increasing, a pressure gradient allows air to be driven into the lungs. Again, this is a little physiology, um, and I don't need you to understand the whole concept of physiology. I just need you to understand the, uh, the importance of the diaphragm descending when we inhale and ascending when we exhale. That's the key. We also think of Boyle's Law, where volume and pressure are inversely proportional at a constant temperature. 
On a side note, all movement is driven by asymmetry gradient, and we see this throughout the natural world. So <clears throat> the diaphragm contracts and flattens on inhale. Okay, so when we breathe in, look at this. The diaphragm contracts and comes down. So think about this. The diaphragm is contracting. So when you contract muscle, guess what? It's pushing on your esophagus, it's pushing on your aorta, it's pushing on your inferior vena cava. And guess what your patients are? They're in a constant state of inhalation. So they're always stuck in that inhalation state because they cannot breathe out properly so they cannot relax the diaphragm. Do, do you see this? So take a screenshot of this. And again, you'll have a reference, but I, when I see a very important concept, I want you to emphasize this. Think about this. If I'm breathing in and your patient's diaphragm is stuck in a contracted state, it's stuck in inhalation. Your chest is expanded and now it's rotated to one side and you're like, oh, Dr. Patel, how do I know this? Well, that's where the infrasternal angle comes in. Guess what, guys? The infrasternal angle will teach you exactly how your patient is breathing. Again, I have to tell you why we do this before you, and now you're going to say, okay, I understand this. I love it. Thank you very much. And it's, I, I really enjoy this concept. It's so good. Now, the diaphragm will relax with exhalation, okay? So look at all these muscles that are involved in the diaphragm, sternocleidomastoid scalenes, pectoralis minor, transverse, serratus anterior, intercostals, okay, uh, rectus abdominis, diaphragm, sternocleidomastoid. So think about the patients that have come into your clinic with tight sternocleidomastoid, tight pectoralis minor, tight serratus anterior, or elongated intercostals and diaphragm, elongated rectus abdominis, and you're thinking, what's going on guys right and you you'll focus on maybe just the tight sternocleidomastoid give them some neck stretches but you forgot to incorporate the breathing into it and you'll stretch the pec minor you'll give them a stretch like this but we didn't incorporate the breathing into it now you understand that the importance of our our profession of how we have to look as a whole unit and this you know this uh i hope you get that uh, out of this and it's going to be fantastic so look okay now after about <laughs> a good uh, how long has it been an hour i finally get to the main topic of infrasternal angle but i had to spend that hour explaining to you why we do what we do right otherwise it doesn't even make sense and then you won't appreciate what the infrasternal angle is all right, so I hope you guys are doing a, uh, enjoying this. Okay, so let's talk infrasternal angle. Okay, let's, let's get to the main topic, main topic. What is the infrasternal angle? So that is a measurement right here of the lower thoracic opening from the xiphoid process from ribs seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? Xiphoid process and lower ribs, which are our false ribs. And why is that important? Think about this. Ribs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they have an attachment to the sternum. So they're not going to get the expansion. They're stuck there. But ribs eight, nine, and 10, which are our false ribs, if they're not moving, then the whole rib cage will be stuck. So we like to see the false ribs go in and out, in and out. And that will explain, that will be able to tell you if your patient is um, is being able to breathe correctly. So how do we measure that? Oh, hey ladies, what do you think? You think uh, Tiger Shroff has a good infrasternal angles? How many of you uh, ladies give a thumbs up for uh, Tiger Shroff here? <laughs> uh, handsome guy, right? But you're thinking, okay, does he have a normal infrasternal angle? You look at this infrasternal angle, but here's the important concept. We will look at this as a static posture and that is incorrect, okay? I don't want a, pa oops, I don't want a patient to come in here 
and you just look at this infrasternal angle, but even look at look at the way Tiger Shroff stands. Look, you can see that the guy, as balanced he is, he shifted to the right. Look at his right shoulder, lower. Look at his right, you see? Look at his neck, his side bent. And if you look at this pattern, and he looks great here, but he's still in the same pattern. So as handsome as he is, he still has a PRI pattern to the right side. So asymmetrical stance. Good job, Sapna. You know, the, the, I love it that you're understanding the concept now. And it's it's a very common stance that people are uh, uh, looking at. But you, if you look at this right here, this is the infrasternal angle that we want to look at. But this is static. We never, never, never want to be able to um, look at this in a static way. We want to look this dynamic. So now we're going to look at this. Why is it helpful to know the infrasternal angle? I know most of you are sad that I don't, uh, we're past the tiger shroff. Don't worry, you can go back to look at him later. <laughs> it helps to show the non-sternal ribs are moving or how they are positioned in space. It helps show where the diaphragm is in during rest but it helps to identify compensatory mechanics and patterns that may be associated with neck and low back pain. Okay, now what is normal infrasternal angle? Okay, what is normal? To put it simply, it is unknown what a normal infrasternal angle is, okay? What a normal infrasternal angle is, an infrasternal angle is unique. I like to measure it 90 degrees, and that's why to, that they're mesoskeletal system, but what we want to learn from our clients is a dynamic infrasternal. So what we want to do is we want to see this, okay? This is a handy in determining what is optimal for ranges of motion happening in our extremities. So we want clients to be able to widen. So if, this is a key concept here. This is the whole point of this lecture. So please pay attention to this part right here. What we want our clients to be able to do is we want their infrasternal angle to widen when they breathe in and we want it to decrease when we exhale and you're saying well how do I see this and I'm going to show you in a supine position how we're going to be able to see it I want you to see it supine and I want you to do it uh, dynamically as uh, as well okay so it is known that individuals who are inclined towards a narrow ranges do not have normal ranges of motion in their extremities as well because, okay? So how do we measure this? You're going to find the xiphoid process. And this will form the apex of the angle, okay? You're going to measure the side of ribs 8 through 10, which are the false ribs, okay? and meaning they have one common attachment. This is how we measure infrasternal angle. But So they're supine right now, and I'm going to measure this statically. But remember, we want them to see how they're breathing in and out. So what I have them do, so take a screenshot of this. This is the most important, most important concept of this, okay? And this is the very uh, important concept that I want you to understand. When we're testing infrasternal angle variability and dynamic movement, the patient is in supine position. I want you to go and determine the infrasternal angle first. Then, patient will gradually flex both shoulders until the rib cage begins to lift off or roll superiorly towards the head. So once the patient is overhead and this rib cage is starting to go back, you stop because then they'll compensate. And then what you do is you ask the patient to take a deep breath in. And just normally, don't tell them, don't give them any verbal cues or attack. Don't tell them to breathe. Just tell them to breathe normally. Because if you tell them how to breathe, they won't do it what they normally do. Just tell them to breathe. Don't even tell them that you're measuring something or stuff like that. Okay, that's a goniometer. This is very simple. This is just a goniometer that you want to uh, measure with. Okay, you can also do it just with your thumbs. Okay, you can do it with your arms here. But 
what you want to do is get, get the patient to take a normal breath in and out and monitor the infrasternal angle during inhalation and exhalation. Okay? So what we want to see is we want to see, does the, the patient and inhale, is it going out and is it coming in? What you'll find in patients that have problems, so these are the patients that come into the clinic, guess what? When they have come in, let's say they have neck pain or they have low back pain, when they take a deep breath in, this thing doesn't move at all. It'll be stuck either at 60 degrees or it'll be stuck at 100 degrees. And even when they breathe in and out, there is no dynamic movement of the infrastrainer angle. So if you understand this, please uh, give me a, a thumbs up in the chat if you have a question, because this is the most important part of this lecture. So if I don't understand, if you don't understand it, I have to explain it again. So is there anybody that needs me to explain this again? I will be happy to. But mention that in the chat that say, hey, can you say that again or what part of it? Because, okay, patient is aware that their body is showing chest movement. So help it compare. Yes. Okay. So anybody understand? Let me, let me just say it again. So here's step one. Let's, uh, patient comes into the clinic. Okay. No, neck pain, low back pain, regardless of the diagnosis. I want you to, and I'm going to tell you the other, uh, uh, the other, um, the other uh, test that I do also. So <clears throat> this is just one of the tests that we do to see, but I'm gonna have them measure statically what their infrasternal angle is right here, supine, okay? Whatever it is, it might be 80, 90, it may be 60, it may be 100, that's their static. So you write that down, okay? Then I'm going to have them raise their hands overhead and then once the rib cage starts going back, rolling back, I have them stop, okay, with their arms still. Then I'm going to ask them to take a deep breath in and out. What I'm looking for visually is I am looking to see if on inhalation does the rib cage go up and widen, and on exhalation does it come down. 90% of your patients that come into the clinic with problems with chronic no neck pain and chronic low back pain, their infrasternal angle will be stuck in either a wide position or it'll be stuck in a narrow position. That's the concept right there, okay? So what I'm going to do is, what if you don't understand until you see that it doesn't make sense to understand the exercises so that's why you know uh i was talking to dr Nir bansali that we split it up into two groups meaning today i explained to you what this is you go one week and you see all this and i want you to see how many patients you came or saw that have a narrow wide narrow wide on your family members yourself look at it and then when you come back next week and say, okay, uh, Dr. Patel, how do I fix it? Then when we do the wide uh, uh, um, uh, exercises and the uh, uh, narrow exercises, you'll be able to uh, uh, understand it. And I have to figure out a way that you're able to see the volume. You don't actually have to see the volume as long as you can see the video of the exercises and then I'll make it available for you to uh, have. So don't worry about that. Uh, so that's going to be... Uh, very good. Okay, so let's go. Now, if you see a patient that is stuck in a narrow position, you're going to get a patient that has a thoracic kyphosis of reduction. They're going to have a decrease in lumbar lordosis. They're going to have an anteriorly rotated anonymate and a counter-nutated sacrum. And you're thinking, why is that, Dr. Patel? That's because they're compensating to get air into their lungs. Those that have a wide infrasternal angle, these are compensations. The sacrum is nutated. Then you're going to see a person that has an increase in lumbar lordosis. They have an increase in thoracic kyphosis, and they'll have an increase in cervical lordosis. Okay? Because they need to breathe, they have figured out over the years how to compensate, how to get air into their lungs, and they have built this posture of how to 
breathe in and out. So they increase their lumbar doses. They increase their thoracic kyphosis. They increase their cervical low doses because they are compensating for that wide infrasternal angle. The people that are narrow, they've decreased their lumbar low doses. They're anteriorly rotated and they've actually, that what they've done is to learn to compensate that. Okay, so I uh, now you understand compensations, but <clears throat> let's look at this so that you see it uh, uh, objective test. So here's the infrasternal angle. You, you start off, what I like to see is if they can start off with 90 degrees first, and then when they take a deep breath in, it widens, and when they take a deep breath exhale, it goes into a narrow. So they, they widen, and then they go into narrow, okay? So <clears throat> what happens is, <clears throat> If they're stuck in one way or the other, then we'll have to fix it. But if you get a patient that starts at 90 degrees, they take a deep breath in and they go wide and they exhale and their infrasternal comes back and it's narrow, then they're breathing perfectly. And there, guess what? They're not a candidate for infrasternal angle or this. Then we can move on to something else. But I guarantee you, anybody that has pain, anybody that has dysfunction, they're not gonna be breathing correctly. There will be the rare patient, because that's why I want you to practice. You just go there, you know, say, Dr. Patel, I measured a couple people, they're breathing perfectly. You know what? Fantastic, I love it. That means we can move on and try something else. And this is where they, then you can do your traditional physical therapy of, uh, and there's some people that are breathing perfectly, but most people that have chronic pain, that have chronic dysfunctions, or even just sometimes uh, athletes, they are not breathing correctly. So they'll, they'll have some kind of uh, issues here. Okay. So <clears throat> some people are asking me how to use a goniometer for the measurement. Um, I had, uh, unfortunately, I, 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 the, the video is in the uh, in this PowerPoint presentation. I, uh, for some reason, I can't get it to uh, uh, play. So I'll, I'll work with Dr. Bensali on how to get that the videos to play correctly. But right now, at least you have the concept. At least you'll have this, and then you'll be able to reference it uh, later. But uh, next week, by next uh, week, I'll hopefully I can uh, um, get it to. Uh, uh, get it to um, work correctly, okay? So I apologize for that. <clears throat> All right. So before, the, some other things that they can do, okay? So remember, whenever, let's say you have a patient that has a meniscus issue or that has an ACL issue, or we always do a, a, um, a cluster of tests, okay? A cluster, <clears throat> okay? I also check, can they touch their toes? If they cannot, then they'll have an inhalation bias, a narrow. If they can, they might be able to do, they might have a compression bias by going wide. So this is, okay, take a screenshot of this as well, because this is a very important concept. Can they complete a deep squat to 90 degrees? If they cannot, then they might have a compression bias and they might be wide. If, they're, if they can, they might have an inhalation bias. Again, this goes back to the compensations that they've done. So after measuring the infrasternal angle, check these things. So I want you to check. So this week, the whole week, these are the tests that you're going to do, okay? You're gonna check their infrasternal angle. Can your patient touch their toes? Can they complete a deep squat? Do they have 65 degrees of glenohumeral extension? If no, they might have a wide compression bias because that they're substituting. If they can, they might be narrow. And here's the key. Most of the patients you're gonna see is they're gonna be asymmetrical. They might be able to do it on one side. They may not be able to do it on the other side. So the asymmetry is the unfortunately the, the problem. Single knee to chest. Can they get to 100 degrees of hip flexion without lifting or externally rotating the other leg? So if they can, they might have, they're negative. If not, they have asymmetrical issues. And if it's easier on the left, they're stuck in that left AIC pattern. 
So that's a good question. If the patient is obese, you know, sometimes they've been eating a little too much uh, rice and rotli, you're thinking, well, how do I get through that? You can actually palpate the infrasternal angle pretty correct, uh, uh, pretty significantly. Uh, you'll be able to still uh, palpate it. So I've had patients that are uh, obese. You just have to kind of mess around with that uh, and you'll be able to still see that because at the end of the day, you'll still be able to see the infrasternal angle, even if they're a little bit overweight. Uh, um, but that's a good question. Supine straight leg raise. Can they get active straight leg raise to 90 degrees without the other leg lifting or externally rotating the other leg? Supine glenohumeral flexion. Can they bring their glenohumeral joint with elbow bent to their ear? Okay, so these are, these are things that uh, um, I want you to check. And again, these are cluster things. The number one thing I want you to check is this. But let's say I find this, then I, what I do is I also check these just to kind of reiterate this. But if all you can do is just uh, uh, measure uh, the infrasternal angle for right now, I'm happy. I'm, you know, this is, this is what you want to start to do, okay? <clears throat> these videos aren't going to play, uh, um, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> ah! <clears throat> so <clears throat> as we kind of come to, uh, um, let me get to, as we come to everything that we've done so far, I want you to take a screenshot of this and this is what you're gonna do for me for next week, okay? So where do I start, okay? Let's say the patient comes in, okay? The patient comes in and they say, I have neck pain, I have back pain, I have shoulder pain. Um, there, you take a nice thorough history, look at their medical history, look at their MRI, look at their x-rays, whatever you can. You know, again, we always wanna look at everything, uh, that we've acknowledged everything, okay? And we'll look at their static posture, don't tell them anything, just see how they're standing, okay? And you can even look at dynamically, see how they're walking back and forth, okay? Then while they're, before you have them sit, before you, see if they can touch their toes, okay? Can they do a 90 degree deep squat, okay? Measure their glenohumeral extension. This is all before you get them supine. You don't want to move a patient from standing to sitting to supine to prone and all that many times because if they're irritated, if you change them too many times, they're gonna get more irritated. But if they're really, really in a lot of pain and they can't do these tests, then wait. Wait for them to calm down a little bit and do your regular modalities Remember, if they're in the acute phase, if they just hurt themselves, you don't need to start with this. Try to calm down the pain first, and then maybe the next session or the session afterwards, you can build this. This is the long term that we want to fix this, okay? Measure their single knee to chest. Is it symmetrical? Measure their straight leg raise. And you're thinking, you know what, Dr. Patel? They're here for neck pain. Why do I need to measure straight leg raise? It's all connected. Even if they come in for shoulder pain, guess what? I measure their straight leg raise. Even if they come in for neck pain, I measure, can they do single knee to chest? It's all important. Finally, after I've done that, I'm gonna measure their infrasternal angle the way that I showed you, okay? <clears throat> the other tests that I like to do, and these are the ones that I showed you last year at the, uh, at the session that we had, is that <clears throat> I like to do the glenohumeral horizontal abduction test which is this test. This is the more, uh, one of the best. Can their shoulder go past 30 degrees off the table into horizontal abduction? Okay, patient lies supine with knees flexed, flatten the lumbar spine, passively take the arm into horizontal abduction. And a positive test is indicated by limited horizontal abduction. Less than 30 degrees is considered limited. So if they can't do that, then what that tells me is that the rib cage is rotated to that right side if there's asymmetrical, okay? Now, how about, uh, you call this the OBERS test or the modified OBERS, but we actually use it to see where their pelvis is in space. Do they have a positive adduction drop test? This test where their pelvis is. If they're able to drop down, 
then they're negative, they're, then their pelvis is okay. But if their knee cannot drop down, then there's something wrong with the pelvis right here and the diaphragm is being affected on that. Remember the iliac is the quadratus all affect this. This glenohumeral internal rotation, that's a positive test. This is a negative test. If they're negative, then their rib cage is aligned correctly. If they're positive, then their rib cage is rotated to their right side. And then there's something wrong with their asymmetry and their infrasternal angle there. Now, look at their lower trunk rotation. If they're limited to the right, okay, but they're okay on the left, then they're compensating here as well, okay? So that test is for iliolumbar laxity. So <clears throat> these are the tests that I want you to do and find out what's going on for the next week. And what we'll do is then I'll teach you then how do we fix it? And the, uh, how do we fix it is we're going to be able to <clears throat> pretty much give you the opportunity to say, okay, you know what? My patient is stuck in a wide infrasternal angle. That's okay. I'll show you the five exercises you can do for that. Oh, my patient is stuck in a narrow uh, uh, infrasternal angle. Perfect. We'll give you that. This is for people that, remember, PRI is broad. I can't cover everything. I'm only focusing on infrasternal angle. So if you have questions about PRI itself, if you have questions about that, those are some things that you might want to talk to Dr. Niraj Bansali and Dr. Vikas uh, Patel because they've taken my class before and they can, uh, to, my goal is to just introduce you to infrasternal angle. So if there's questions about just regular stuff, I don't want to deviate the chat on just that. I will, I will answer questions on infrasternal angle and PRI, but if you're asking uh, other questions related to PRI, it's going to deviate from the topic. So let's uh, uh, focus on the diaphragm and that. And if there's other questions, uh, maybe Dr. Bensali and Dr. Vikas Patel can uh, help you with that. Okay. So uh, I hope that this is a good introduction uh, to everything. Uh, um, um, so a lot of information today. I want you to go and practice on your patients, on your friends, learn to take the infrasternal angle correctly. Then when we return and go over treatment and case studies, because there's always, and I'll figure out how to get the, uh, get the uh, videos to work uh, somehow, uh, hopefully that works, but at least you'll have this and I'll uh, get a PDF version of this to uh, Dr. Niraj Bansali. So you guys have uh, this for you and maybe he can email it to you or something like that. So we'll figure something out, all right? <laughs> Fantastic, sir. It was a wonderful session. Uh, sir, are you going to take question and answers? Yeah, let me uh, uh, see if I can. Uh, uh, okay, so you see uh, just me now, right? Uh, both, both of us, sir. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's good. Now, um, if they can go, if they want to come in, uh, where, do, where will the uh, questions come in? Yeah, they will be in the chat group on your right side, sir, right side of the screen. But oh, I no. will put on the screen only, so need not have to worry about it. Okay, yeah. yeah so friends, they, uh, um, I hope, how was it? Did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was fantastic. And even all the participants are enjoying it so well. There are so many comments full of chat box uh, with the comments. Uh, they, are, they all are enjoying the way you are presenting is superb as always. And, okay, uh, good. I, I'm glad. I have to figure out how to get the uh, the video to work so you and I can maybe work on it during the week. Not today, but maybe work on it when we have time and then we'll figure it out. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead and uh, open the chat uh, and then let's talk about this um, whenever yeah. you have time. Yeah, friends, you can write uh, your questions in the chat group. Uh, uh, Dr. Danny will answer your questions. Meanwhile, I would like to let you know about the about few things. That One is about the certification of this course. Uh, uh, the certificate will be issued after the next Sunday's attendance. So those who have attended both the level one and level two of this uh, infrastructure angle, uh, they will be eligible for receiving the certificate. Uh, so you are not going to receive individual certificate for level one. Uh, it will be a combined certificate of for level one and level two. Uh, another thing is that uh, you need not have to send screenshot uh, of uh, this live program to me at present uh, 
once the the second level is over we will distribute the certificates on uh, before the friday so friday of the next to next week uh, if you don't receive by that time then you send me uh, on my uh, uh, whatsapp number the screenshots of your attendance of both the levels and the screenshot of your forms uh, so this is the procedure for uh, the certification uh, another thing is that uh, uh, we are going to organize um, a wonderful uh, program that is uh, uh, with collaboration of oro university that will be a seven days program consecutive seven days and that that is a certification program so you will receive a wonderful certificate from oro university and which is uh, internationally el eligible uh, so we will announce the details uh, very soon it will start from 8th of uh, the august and it will be for seven consecutive days uh, uh, thank you dr denny for uh, your wonderful uh, information uh, sir one question is there from uh, dr heta kotak uh, mm -hmm. she is asking how to measure it uh, in obese patient yeah that's a good question you know uh, people always think that is actually uh, uh you know yes they're gonna have a little bit more fat on them but actually with palpation i've actually measured it uh from the xiphoid process and then you're able to get in there and the rib angle you'll really be able to measure it with a longer goniometer and the key remember the key with the infrasternal angle is we measure it statically our goal is to see if it's 90 degrees and on when they go overhead we want to see does it expand on inhalation does it get to 100 110 and then on exhalation does it come back so if on an obese patient most likely it'll be stuck it'll be mostly stuck wide you'll see on most uh, patients that are obese it'll be stuck here even when they breathe in and out it will not be able to come back and it'll, it'll just be stuck here so most patients that i've seen that are obese their their uh, infrasternal angle will just be stuck like this uh, and they're compensated because they've got the big belly and they're they're trying to breathe so what they do is they compensate and that infrasternal angle will just stay they're not able to so think about this they're they're breathing in right so someone that's really obese they're breathing in breathing in breathing in but they cannot exhale <sighs> So with someone that's really wide, we have to teach them about exhalation. So start with that. So if someone that is really obese, you'll be able to, they, we need to drop that infrasternal angle into exhalation. So most of my patients that are males that are really big, they're just stuck in wide and we want to breathe out. So hopefully uh, uh, that answered your question. That Was that okay? Yeah. That makes sense? Yes. Sir. So I think Musa, uh, uh, provide your... Yeah, no, I can't. Uh, Abhishek, uh, we, I, I will run it in the scroll uh, so you can notice the uh, contact numbers. Uh, friends, if you are asking the question, please write Q in front of question so we can easily pick from the chat. Uh, sir, this is so, the question. Uh, that's a good uh, question. Uh, Bos Boski Panchal, right? So what is a normal range for eyes? A perfect question. I really like that question. So as I explained in the, uh, the, we want to start off with about statically about 90 degrees. Okay. Some people may be 80, some people may be 100, but here's the key that I want you to look for in a patient. Even though if they're static at 80, 90, or 100, when they take that inhalation, I want to see the infrasternal angle change and when they exhale, I want to change into exhalation. So let's say you measure your static infrasternal angle at 90 degrees. When they inhale, I like to see it go to 100, 110. And then when they exhale, I like to see it go to 80 or 70. So remember, the infrasternal angle has to be dynamic. It's not static. We want to see the dynamic. Is the air able to breathe in and out? in and out and that is a healthy diaphragm what my main goal or uh, trying to explain is in patients with chronic pain they'll be stuck they'll either be stuck this way or they'll be stuck this way even when they inhale this is how they inhale they'll inhale like this and they'll exhale like that there is no dynamic movement of that infrasternal angle and these are the people that will always be stuck here so think about this think about this going back to your obese patient, big, right? Their diaphragm is 
like this, wide. Its state contracted. Who are your people that have acidity, uh, high blood pressure, and all those? Your heavy people, right? So it makes sense anatomically that if I'm stuck wide, I'm compressing my esophagus, I'm compressing the inferior vena cava, I'm compressing the aorta, and guess what? So some of it, even though they're obese, we, uh, we always uh, focus on, okay, lose weight, do that. But you know what? We can start the getting them healthy by learning them, teaching them to exhale and start the process of uh, getting them better as well. So, you, you know, this is a, a, like I said, I learned this just, uh, um, and I wish I had learned it uh, earlier, but, uh, you know, we are, we're always learning. I, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, Dr. Bensali and I will tell you, Physical therapy is a lifelong learning process. We're always learning. So, you know, as students, I you have to learn every day, take your concepts. And like I said, I if this doesn't work, that's okay. There's many other concepts that are, are going to work. But this is one thing that I think uh, if you look at our uh, culture, if we look at our ancestors, breathing has always been important, but we didn't never understood the science behind it. I mean, some of you did. I You mentioned some good stuff in the chat, but... This is a, a easy way to explain it to patients. So hopefully it makes sense. So hopefully that answered your question. Do healthy individuals can also shift? Uh, uh, yeah, the healthy individuals should be able to shift. Like I said, the, the whole thing of uh, purpose is you should be able to go wide and narrow, wide and there. That's a healthy individual. So if you have no pain, think about this. If you have no pain and your infrasternal angle is not shifting healthy, you eventually will have that pain. Right now, you're only 20, 21, 24, 25. You will start, you'll start compensating, compensate, and then 30, 40, you'll start feeling it. So you need to fix it now, you see, so. No, 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 uh, Raji, that's next week. So that that's the whole point is, uh, I'm gonna show you how to fix it, but, uh, the whole point of this week was just to explain the philosophy and the anatomy because I'm going to show you how to fix the wide and I'm going to show you how to fix the narrow, but it's too much information all in one day. You, you get overwhelmed. Uh, so that's why I broke it up into two sessions um, because, uh, but I like the enthusiasm. I will show you, of course, I'm going to show you how to fix it. Uh, that's, that's the whole point of this. So the good question, uh, if, what if the patient is having a weak core and unable to do deep squat? That's okay. It's just one test that we want to do. We, that cluster of tests that I showed you, can they do everything else like that? And you'll be surprised that once we fix their infrasternal angle, it might be a neuromuscular component and they may be able to deep squat without you even exercising them and strengthening them. So that's the beauty behind this is you, a lot of times people say, oh, that person is weak. Weak, weak, weak core, weak core, weak core, uh, stabilization. But guess what? Some people I've just helped breathe, infrasternal angle and some uh, positioning and they can do a deep squat and it was all neural reflexive uh, training posture. Remember, posture is dynamic. So that was uh, that was the whole point. So great question. You guys are uh, very smart and I love the question. These are questions that I would ask as well. So I hope uh, uh, that you guys uh, understand that uh, this is all dynamic and uh, um Good question. So, yeah, so good question. Uh, how do we explain to patients why we're doing infrasternal angle if the pain is at a different point? So this is where you take out your anatomy model or you show them the the, the, the best thing that I like to uh, show is how everything is related. And uh, you show the muscles, how they're, they're really that one uh, diagram that I showed you where it goes from the neck here and all the way down, that that whole chain is related. So a lot of times people, like you said, you have neck pain and you're like, okay, or if they have a uh, low back pain, why are you measuring this? But think about this. This is the key right here. This is how that people compensate. Your neck should be pretty stable. Your thoracic should be mobile and your low back should be stable. If I don't have movement in my thoracic spine, this is where the total motion release uh, also, so there's concepts that are guess what? I'll compensate at my neck and I'll compensate at my low back. So you teach them that you are compensating because you don't have movement here. That's why you have pain in your neck. That's why you have pain in your back. You don't really have the problem there, but we're going to fix the source of the problem. So when you explain that I'm trying to find the source and to give you long-term relief, the patient will be like, thank you. I appreciate that. So that's what we want, long-term relief. 
Yeah, so this is for me. Uh, will the level two be a free or a paid? It is free. Uh, both the levels are absolutely free. You just need to attend it. And the date and time is next Sunday, same time at 8 p.m. Uh, sharp. We will start Indian Standard Time. So uh, please be there. So, what is the position of the diaphragm in narrow versus wide? Perfect. So, in a wide, the position is going to be contracted. In a narrow, it's going to be what descended. So what we want to see is, uh, if I had the video of that, but uh, the position when the patient is wide, that is contracted. In a narrow, it's in a state of exhalation and it's ascended there. It's not able to move up and down, up and down. So the, the, the whole purpose of the diaphragm, uh, and I wish the video uh, um, uh, worked. I had a good uh, 3D video. You can just YouTube it, uh, um, uh, uh, is the ability now, I, I'm not sure, like in this chat, do you think the, the YouTube would work or not really? Uh, no, um, means what exactly you want to do, sir? Well, uh, see if I, uh, um, do you see my screen here or no? No, we can't see. Okay. The so reason can, I will screen share and I will play from my uh, screen. Uh, uh, right uh, in the private chat. Here, do this. And then I'm going to uh, um, share the YouTube link. And if you can play that, play that video for me. <coughs> yeah. So meanwhile, shall we take a few other questions? Sir, infrastructure angle less than normal can affect your absorption of nitrogen of food? Yes, yes, because what we're uh, what we're doing is we're either compressing on the liver, we're compressing on the uh, the stomach and the esophagus, and that will affect that as well. So this goes back to our basic concept of yoga and why it helps digestion, it helps blood pressure. It goes back to the uh, um, it goes back to uh, breathing correctly. <laughs> so. Uh, um, but you guys know this concept. We know that from our ancestor yoga, uh, breathing is so important. And I'm, I'm going to be able to uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, when we do the treatment, uh, we're going to we're going to discuss uh, more of the, the breathing techniques. I have good, about 10 to uh, 12 good exercises that you're going to be able to uh, um, uh, understand here. So this is good. Hopefully you can uh, hear it. Um, so if you look at this, let's see. Maybe. Go ahead and play it, and then. Diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin, dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. It gains its shape from its attachments and from the organs that surround it. Especially Can everybody hear it? And liver. The diaphragm attaches at the costals along the lower rib cage, high in the front of the sternum, and deeply in the back along the spine. The diaphragm also attaches to itself by a central tendon, making the diaphragm one of the unique muscles of the body. The diaphragm uses its central tendon and its attachments as leverage to flatten during inhalation. The expansion of the ribs comes from the resistance of the internal organs to downward movement. As the internal organs are slow to move, the ribs expand to make room for the lungs. Look at this. See how it goes. Inhalation, exhalation. Inhalation, this is a great inhalation. So imagine a patient that is stuck in inhalation or imagine a patient that is stuck in exhalation. There's no dynamic movement here. So all these muscles, all the, the esophagus, the inferior vena cava, do you see it visually now why that movement of the infrasternal angle and why that is so important for our patients to be able to breathe in and out and in and out? Uh, did that help, Saida or Eiji, to, uh, to see that, how that can affect that? Um, so you know what? That's a fantastic way. I will just share you the YouTube links, and if you can share that, because next week I have a lot of video, and if it doesn't work, then it's going to uh, – people are going to be like, what's going on? So it worked great. Do you want to uh, do a recap of PRI from uh, the, the P, uh, this gentleman that showed uh, – um, let me share this link. Uh, um, what we're going to do here, this, uh, uh, um, this, this video is a, a recap of PRI. And so did you get that, Dr. Bensali, uh, that link? 
So, okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can listen to this, he explains, I mean, I explained it as well, but it's always good to hear it a couple of times of why we shift right and left, right and left. And then you can uh, watch this YouTube video again uh, um, and uh, see it, uh, understand what's going on. And next week, again, I'll be able to, uh, the more you uh, hear it, the more you'll be able to, I will have this PDF for you. So I, I'm hoping that you guys are uh, um, uh, understanding. Yes, we can hear, but a bit low pitch. Yeah, I know that's the, the thing uh, uh, with some of this video is it's a low pitch, but at least you'll have the, uh, the YouTube links in the presentation, so you can always listen to it uh, uh, privately in your own comfort of your own home. I'll have all the links, uh, YouTube links for you, so you'll always have it. Uh, so don't worry about that. If you don't hear it during the presentation, I'll I'll give you the link. I'll give you references, uh, so you can do some uh, research. And remember, our, our main goal is to give you the tools so you yourself can educate yourself. So it's good. Shall I, please? Yes. Uh huh. And our movement patterns are all asymmetrical, and this is completely normal. However, there are times where our natural asymmetry becomes too extreme. So our perfect asymmetry that allows us to move as we do becomes imperfect asymmetry and that's where things can start to go wrong so we have a right side of the body and a left side of the body and they are not the same they're never going to really move in the exact same way and again this is because of how we are structured on the inside when we lose the ability to alternate efficiently go from left foot to right foot left foot to right foot, that is when our, we start to feel pain in our body. Not always, but this is a very common occurrence. We're talking about pain that is not due to uh, disease, sickness, arthritis, or an acute injury. This is a type of pain that just kind of comes out out of nowhere. The reason this occurs is because when you're not alternating, you're pretty much stuck on one side of your body, and it turns out that it's generally the right side of our body. We're two right sides. And again, humans are inherently biased to the right side of our body, whether you're left hand or right hand. And again, it comes down to the structure and organization of our body. When you become too right-sided, and you can no longer get to the left efficiently, it means you've lost range of motion. You've lost range of motion in the pelvis, in the rib cage, and quite often in the neck, and that will cause certain chains of muscles to be overactive and often tight. So there's a lot of tension in certain areas of your body. And other areas of the body to be weaker, to constantly stretch out. Those muscles are not activating properly. And your joints will have limited range of motion. And this is all very predictable because we have tests that show this. And the tests are, again, are very, very predictable. These are just patterns. Patterns of movement and then patterns of restriction. So PRI works by retraining, repositioning structures, basically the pelvis, the ribcage, and the neck, through your own power, your own breathing, your own muscles. I, the PRI therapist rarely does not actually do anything with their own hands. We teach you to reposition your own structures. And all the exercises are devoted to restoring, alternating function from the left side and the right side so that you can walk and breathe without compensation and when you do that a lot of the pains that have built up over the years due to restricted movements uh overly active muscles uh or the or trying to get range of motion where none can be found and so you stretch out structures that shouldn't stretch such as ligaments and you develop now weaknesses in a hip a lot of that type of pain uh will dissipate or go away simply by restoring that alternating movement in your body. Okay. So again, um, I know there was a, a 
<clears throat> there was a little bit of a lag. Uh, it happens uh, during a live session. So at least you have the link to it. But what I wanted to emphasize is, um, so think about the times that we're going through, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus, and you're seeing a lot of uh, deaths reported because patients have underlying secondary issues and they're elderly and they have uh, other issues, but people that are younger are also getting susceptible because they may have an underlying breathing issue and they're not able to breathe in and breathe out and exhale. And guess what? The virus stays stuck in their lungs. And so this is, this is, I'm not saying that PRI cures coronavirus. Don't, I don't want you to uh, think that, but if we have the inability to breathe in and out, inability, we're going to be more susceptible for that virus to stay inside and we won't be able to fight it uh, as well. So breathing uh, uh, plays a good role uh, in being able to fight any kind of disease, uh, any kind of virus. Um, so here in the United States, they're actually doing a lot of research on people that get coronavirus in the hospitals. They're actually, uh, a lot of the therapists are teaching them breathing and the uh, postural uh, breathing and basically the ability to exhale. And they're finding that if they can maintain chest expansion, they're not dying, the critical, they're not dying from coronavirus. They're, they're actually recovering a little bit better. So if you have a patient or if you have a family member that does get coronavirus, teach them breathing, inhalation, exhalation, and uh, you can even do the nostril breathing. And what they've found is that they are not as susceptible to getting pneumonia or complications because of this. Because remember, the coronavirus will attack their lungs. And if we're not able to inhale, exhale, inhale, we're not able to get rid of that uh, uh, as fast. And that's that's the secondary complications that we're having. So see, all this uh, makes sense. And it's, it's something that we want to uh, understand. We have to change with the times and we want to be able to explain what's going on. So I hope that uh, makes sense. So. so it's almost uh, uh, one hour and 46 minutes over. Uh, yeah. Shall we continue with the questions or? Uh, no, I think that's good. I think that we had a fantastic session. Uh, let's, uh, we'll, I look forward to next week and uh, uh, maybe we can work out the the bugs of the, uh, the, the videos uh, and then we'll figure it out. And then, uh, so thank you guys. Uh, hopefully um, you guys uh, learned something uh, and I, uh, I look forward to next week. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful session. It was very informative. And thanks for your time. You have given a lot of time to us. And next week, we are expecting all of us are eagerly waiting for the next week's session and level two. And thanks to everyone for joining and asking a lot of questions and participating so actively. We respect your questions, but there are so many questions left. And uh, if we will try to attend all of them right now, it will take one more session uh, to be arranged. So uh, we will try to uh, clear your doubts in the next sessions. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It was a wonderful time with all of you. Thank you. So okay, much. thank you. All right, Dr. Bentali, I'll see you uh, next week sometime. Yes. Okay.